Should we stop? Yeah, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, okay, so hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you might be. Uh, my name's Constantine. I'm one of the New York fellows and uh, Jim, Jim, you can go ahead and introduce yourself if you'd like. Hi, yeah, I'm Jim. Uh, I'm one of the fellows in London. Yeah, so uh, today Jim and I are going to be presenting a paper titled Revisin Revisiting Dilated Convolution. A simple approach for weekly and semi-supervised semantic segmentation. And you can find a link to the paper here on the, uh, the, the first slide. And we will also, we will post these slides at the, uh, after the presentation. So um, what is this paper about? So in general, weekly supervised segmentation approaches are still significantly inferior to their fully supervised counterparts. So weekly supervised segmentation in this scenario means uh, uh, image level label. So I, if I have a, a, an image of a baby or a person such as this one and only an image level label such as person, how do I create a segmentation mask from that that outlines basically the entire object of, of the image? Fully supervised would be having pixel level labels indicating like background or the object of interest. And the specific problem is that weekly Supervised segmentation approaches struggle to learn how to produce high quality dense object localization maps from image level supervision. So when you only have a label for the image such as person using uh, uh, weekly supervised data usually results in these sort of sparse uh, feature maps which can't be used to produce high quality and, and dense segmentation maps. So the proposed solution that the authors demonstrate in this paper is using the dilated convolution to produce dense object localization maps by enlarging the receptive field of the convolutional kernel. So the, the key takeaway here is that they're going to use the dilated convolution to enlarge the receptive fields of the convolutional kernels. And the result is basically that using, again, just weekly supervised data, such as this image of the baby and an image level label, you can get much more high quality and dense localization maps like you see on the, on the right here. So before we get into detail of, of how they do this, we're gonna go over a couple basic concepts that are very important to the, to the rest of this paper. The first one is a, a class activation map, also known as a CAM. So a class activation map for a particular image basically indicates the discriminative image regions that were used by the convolutional neural network to identify that specific category. So in layman's terms, uh, a class activation map shows what part of the image was important to classifying that image as, you know, whatever it was classified as. So in this example here, we have this image of the boy and the Australian terrier, and the classification in this case is an Australian terrier. So the class activation map for this image will show what parts of the image were important to classifying this as an Australian terrier. And the way that it works is you basically go to the last convolutional layer within the network, doesn't really matter whether you're using VGG or ResNet, somewhere within the, a convolutional network, it will usually transition from convolutional to some form of fully connected. So you go to the last convolutional layer, you pull out the individual feature maps or sort of the, the 2D activations, you run global average pooling on the entire set of activations, which is basically just averaging in the X, Y direction. Um, and you use the result of that basically as the weights for the individual feature maps. So uh, it's just a weighted sum of the activations of the individual 2D activations where the weight is the result of this global average pooling, right? And the result of that will be this nice little sort of heat map that indicates which regions of this image were important to classifying it as whatever it was classified as. Um, this, the, the, one of the pipelines they use uh, in this process is again, the, the end goal here is a segmentation mask, right? So, so one of the ways you can get from an image level label would be you take the image, you feed it through, for instance, some form of convolutional operation, and then you end up with this set of 3D activations. You then compute the class activation map from these activations using this method we just described here. So this sort of block right here 
corresponds to these activations in this image. If you run this image through, for instance, three different convolutional operations, you get three different sets of activations. You can compute the class activation map for each one of those activations. You can then do some sort of weighted combination to get this dense localization map and then use some sort of thresholding operation to get a segmentation map. So what's important to remember here is that the class activation map is basically from an individual set of activations and a dense localization map is some form of combination of multiple class activation maps. And the segmentation mask is when you do some sort of binary thresholding on the dense localization map. So these are some of the vocabulary that you're gonna see come up over and over again in the paper. So, the, uh, weak, the background is basically that weakly supervised image recognition approaches have been extensively researched because it's not that expensive to create weakly supervised data sets. Again, a weakly supervised uh, data set is just where you have images and image level labels, such as, you know, this, this dog, right? And one of the most attractive areas of study within this weakly supervised Im image recognition category is learning how to segment images from only image level annotations. So given a picture like this dog and an image level label like dog, how do we create a segmentation mask like this, which can be used to train segmentation networks? And within this challenge of learning to create segmented images from only image level annotations, the, the most sort of critical the step that remains unsolved is how do you accurately and densely localize object regions so that you can obtain these sort of high quality uh, segmentation maps. So in a nutshell, how do we get from here, this, you know, weekly supervised image to some form of high quality object localization map so that we can create this uh, uh, segmentation map from this dense localization map. And um, one of the, the ways to sort of do this is like we showed a couple slides ago is using uh, class activation maps, right? You can use the class activation maps of a, of a standard convolutional network to get these sort of object cues. Um, the problem with that is that the class activation map usually focuses on the discriminative regions of the image. So what aspects of the object of interest were important to determining this was a baby or a bird as opposed to focusing on this entire object. So you can see here, classifying this as a bird, clearly the head and sort of the, the beak and the eye area is what's important. Same thing goes for the baby, you know, the hands and the head are important, whereas, you know, this bib that the baby is wearing are, isn't, doesn't really carry any disc discriminative information. But the problem is, if we want to segment this, that bib and the rest of the baby absolutely should be included in the segmentation. So these small discriminative regions usually aren't dense enough or extensive enough to train a good segmentation model because they don't encompass the entire object of interest. And the proposed approach in this paper, basically in a nutshell, is transferring the discriminative knowledge from a sort of sparsely highlighted region to adjacent object regions by using this dilated convolution, which will then form this dense object localization map. So basically going from, whoops, going from something like this, right, where, which is sort of uh, sparse and only focuses on the discriminative region to something that highlights most of or all of the object of interest. So the proposed approach in a nutshell is how to get from these using a dilated convolution to uh, feature maps like this. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to Jim, who's gonna talk in more detail about how they do this. Oh, sorry, related work first. Yeah, so yeah, there are two broad uh, categories in which you can put the related work under and what they, you know, the categories they put it in the paper. And the first of those uh, are, are to do with the um, course, course annotations. So these are, it's a similar idea in that you're using uh, object cues to help the uh, segmentation network learn uh, to segment an image. Um, but it's just the type of annotations that you're giving it. So with these course annotations, you're using things like in the top right, the bounding boxes or the uh, scribbles below that. Um, and these work quite well, but the, the main, issue is that they're 
as um, Constantine alluded to a bit, they're really expensive uh, to obtain. They take a lot of time. Um, it would be great, as we've talked about, uh, to use just image level annotations because there's loads of, loads of data for that. So that really motivates uh, the next um, type of weak supervision. Uh, and that's with these Im image level annotations that we've been talking about. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. Um, and uh, the, they go through a number of papers, but the, the main one that this paper really leans on for a lot of the supporting techniques uh, is this uh, adversarial erasing paper. Uh, and it's, it's quite a neat idea. They first train a network, a classification network um, as, as normal. They produce the class activation maps. Uh, and then here, um, so this is the class activation map they produce first on the left here. Uh, then they erase the, the area with the highest activation in those class activation maps or the piece of the image that uh, corresponds to that. And then they train the network again um, and so the network is kind of forced to use other regions to discriminate, to classify the images. Um, and this is done again and again until um, you have uh, a few of these class activation maps and then you can combine them and hopefully they give a uh, dense uh, localization map. But the, uh, the main issue really is that uh, these are slow um, to produce because you have to train the network over and over again to produce the, um, the localization maps. Next slide, please. So the main, uh, really the core technique they're using in this paper uh, are these dilated convolutions. Uh, and the basic idea behind them is quite simple. So on the left, uh, we have a one dilated convolution, uh, a stride to one dilated convolution. Uh, and that's really just your standard convolution that we already know about. On the right, we have a stride one, but two, di two dilated convolution. Uh, and the difference here is that the active elements in the kernel, the convolution kernel, have been spaced out, have been stretched out um, by a pixel. Uh, and the spaces in between have been uh, filled with zeros. Uh, I'll, I'll go into this uh, in a bit more detail in a bit, um, but that's the basic idea. And uh, the real advantage of these is that they um, have uh, a lot more, their receptive field size is, is a lot larger, so they can incorporate a lot more of the surrounding context. And then uh, on the right, on the bottom right here, we have um, the mathematical uh, definition of these. Well, on the left, we have a standard, co uh, standard convolution, uh, one dilated convolution in this, in this uh, context. And then on the right, we have a dilated convolution where L is the dilation factor. And we can see that if we um, put L equals to one, then we get back to our normal convolution, which is the uh, one dilated convolution on the left. Yeah, next slide, please. So these are some example hypothetical kernels um, just um, displayed here in, in a nice array format just to get a better idea of what's going on. Um, so one of the, uh, well, I'll just uh, talk first about how each kernel acts on the input. So the one dilated convolution uh, on the top here, uh, we can see the, that the, the output it produces after acting on the input uh, is quite uh, it's quite focused around the center. It's got quite a small receptive field uh, and it maintains the, the tightness of that uh, input. Um, but as we increase the dilation, we can see the successive outputs um, gradually kind of spread out more and we have, uh, you know, uh, the, the edges of the, of the output kind of benefit more from the center. And that's the really, really the key idea behind this uh, dilated convolution. Uh, but one of the other things to note is that Obviously, as we increase our kernel size or increase our, our dilation factor, our dil dilation rate, um, the, uh, the output obviously decreases uh, correspondingly. The output dimension increases correspondingly. Uh, and so in the previous slide, we had a two dilated, you know, two, a two stride, one dilated convolution and a one stride, two dilated convolution. Um, and I hope you can kind of imagine that those two produce the same uh, dimensions. So we've got to be quite careful in uh, how we choose our strides and how we choose our, 
uh, dilation factors to produce these um, these class activation uh, yeah these class activation maps which um, are yeah are, are the same dimensions essentially next slide um, so here's uh, kind of a, quite a high level overview of um, the the network that's used to train these dilated convolution kernels um, to produce the class activation maps. And uh, I'll go into more detail in, in further slides, but this is just a, a brief overview. Uh, we're really just training a classification network, as we've already said. So, uh, but the difference is we just use these convolution kernels towards the end of our standard whatever classification network we want to use. Um, once we produce these um, convolutional blocks here, then uh, we apply a global average pooling, which flattens them out uh, into kind of one by however many feature maps uh, kind of vectors here. And, um, and then each of those is passed through the same fully, fully connected net layer uh, to produce, or a number of fully connected layers to produce uh, the kind of output vector, which is then you just apply a normal sigmoid cross entropy loss uh, in the normal standard classification kind of thing. Um, and, but really, I mean, although we're interested in uh, optimizing this network to in, in increase the classification accuracy, we're not really in, in, interested in the actual classification accuracy we're really interested in these dilated convolutions. And uh, so, we, so then when we want to create our, our, um, our dense localization map, or we want to create our separate class activation maps, we, uh, we take the outputs uh, from these dilated convolutions. Uh, and so at the bottom here, we have an example of the different uh, activation maps from different kernels uh, of different dilation rates. So with our standard convolution on the left with a di one dilation, dilation rate of one, uh, we can see as before uh, what, how, you know, uh, what Constantine talked about. And that's the uh, using the, the network, really just only focusing on the discriminative regions. Uh, as we increase the dilation rate, uh, we can see that the, um, the, the, the pixels, the areas, the features, closer to the center, the body of the bird, uh, are actually um, benefiting from the discriminative nature of the head. So if we see this red element in the, in the kernel, uh, that represents uh, where the, the, the feature is, is gonna be placed once you've done the convolution. And it's benefiting from the discriminative, the high activations that have been produced from the head. So, and as we see, like, as, as we increase this dilation rate, uh, this happens more and more and we get a bigger spread of the activation across the map. But with that also comes uh, a lot more noise. Uh, so in the next slide, uh, I'll talk about how we kind of combine these to reduce this noise and produce a nice uh, dense localization map. So this is the same network, but just drawn in a slightly different way. Um, just to go into a bit of detail about the actual classification network, in the paper, they used the uh, VGG16 without the fully connected and pooling layers, so they just took those off. Um, partly because, uh, as we talked about, when you increase the dilation rate to some a really high number, like nine that they used in the paper, um, your, your resulting output dimensions go down quite, quite significantly. And um, to remove the, the later layers and, and pooling layers, you're really maintaining the dimensionality of your, your output of your network. Um, and then here we have, uh, below we have all the different uh, class activation maps, the activation maps for each of the dilated convolutions, really what we're just showing in the, in the slide before. Um, and then the way the, uh, these activation maps are combined in the paper uh, is in this, ooh, in this, weighted, in this weighted sum at the bottom here. Um, now, so I think there's a bit of an issue in, with this, uh, with this uh, equation. Um, but the main idea really is that you're, you're using your standard convolution, H0, which uh, 
is the one dilated convolution in the left here. Um, and then adding to it um, a smaller kind of averaged weight between the other dilated convolution kernels. Uh, so a third of each of these three, six, and nine dilated convolutions in this case. And um, I think in the paper, they, they, they don't really go into much depth about why they chose this. They just, they, um, they said that it just ends up uh, working in their case. Um, but one of the obvious things they also don't mention is that um, they didn't really talk about stride at all. So uh, we have no idea whether each of these HI, these different um, activation maps, have the same uh, dimensions as each other. Um, of course, if we're trying to add them together, we'd hope that they would. So perhaps they do, they change the stride and the dilation rates uh, kind of together just to achieve that effect. Or perhaps they just upsample, but we don't really know. But that's one of the um, things that's a bit unclear in the paper. But the main idea really is that they're just um, taking uh, the original class activation map and then adding an average of all, a mean activation map of all the others with the higher dilation rates. And then they add these together to produce the dense localization map, which has now, because of the um, averaging effect, you've basically lost uh, some of these noisy areas in the nine dilated convolution, and, uh, and, but also still retained uh, this dense map where you've covered lots of the areas of the image which aren't necessarily discriminative for a standard convolution, but are um, for the higher dilated convolutions. Next, please. So this is the um, overview that Constantine showed earlier. And we've gone through these first few sections. So we've, we've already talked about the, uh, the dilated convolutions, how they produce the class activation maps, uh, and then how we do this weighted combination that I talked about in the previous slide. Um, and how we've produced this dense localization map. Now, um, it would be a simple assumption would be to the, that you could just then threshold this uh, dense localization map and say, hey, uh, all the activations above a certain threshold are going to be my object area, and then all the activations below that are going to be my background area. Um, but what they do in the paper is slightly different, and I'll go through that in the next slide. So they do actually do what I just said uh, to, to produce the foreground. So on the bottom here, we have uh, the dense localization map, which has been thresholded, and they've taken the top 30% of the activations, uh, and that defines the foreground. Um, but instead of just defining everything else as the background, uh, they use something else, and that's, uh, they use a, a saliency map. These are really, um, they're like soft image segmentations, but they're for detecting the object of interest. Uh, in an image, so the, the most important object uh, in an image. And it's really kind of, in this case, acts as a more a rougher, coarser segmentation. Um, and they, I put a link at the bottom if you want to read more about those, but they, uh, here they really um, just take the saliency values, they're normalized saliency value, values, so any below um, 0 0.06 they take as background. Um, and then there's a subtle point to make here. When they combine these foregrounds and the background, um, it's really just a union between the two. So they just add them, uh, except that the, um, the conflicting pixels. So for example, the pixels that are labeled as foreground, um, but in the saliency map are, 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 are classed as background, um, they're essentially ignored in the loss function. They don't take part in the loss function. And we'll come to the loss function soon, um, but they're ignored. So in this, in this case, you could even add in like an extra color in the segmentation mask, like a red color, uh, which has the uh, conflicting pixels. And they don't really play a part in, in any of the training. Yes, is that? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's it. Okay, so Constantine is now gonna go through uh, the, the overall network now and more of the loss function in detail. So the, the main point of the paper is sort of split into two pieces. The first is how do we use weekly supervised data to produce a segmentation mask like this? The second is then once we have a segmentation mask like this, how do we implement it to train a segmentation network which can segment you know, individual objects within uh, 
within an image. So they basically split the loss function into, into two. The first section is the, the weekly supervised segmentation learning. So this entire process is conducted using weekly supervised data, so only image level labels. And the way it works is you take your image, right? You do this entire dilated convolution and segmentation process that we talked about in the preceding slides, and you end up with the segmentation map like you just saw on the previous slide that Jim was talking about. This right here, this with the A below it, this is what they consider the ground truth or basically the equivalent of like a human annotated label in this training process. Um, it's also referred to as MW sub C. The W here refers to weekly supervised and C is just specific to a class. So in this case, it's a dog. The way they get a prediction is then basically within these feature map feature maps here, there are basically C plus one feature maps. Again, C is the number of classes and you add one because you always have this background map. And so they basically take the arg max of the background and whatever specific class feature map. So in this case, a dog, and that's how they end up getting a predicted mask or predicted segmentation mask like this. These two are then what are used in the loss function, which in general, the loss function looks like this. You're just trying to minimize this cost function. In more detail, if we sort of work backwards, this F sub UC, this is basically the class specific probability of a specific location within one of these maps, right? So you'll notice that this first portion here has this M sub WC, and this second portion has the N sub WC hat, where hat, as in most cases in machine learning, usually denotes something that's been predicted, and this is our ground truth. So in layman's terms, this loss function basically does, just does a pixel-wise comparison of the ground truth and the predicted map across all classes and across all images, and it tries to minimize that distance. So that sort of makes sense conceptually why that works in order to train this. And again, the key takeaway here is that they're using the output of this dilation and, and uh, segmentation process. This is the ground truth. Um, now, you can also implement a, a, a semi-supervised data in this. So semi-supervised data is data that has pixel level annotations. And the, the key th thing here is that you can share parameters between the two networks. So these networks, in essence, when they say shared parameters, you know, they're sharing the weights and the biases and all the, all the values. So they are basically just the exact same network. It's just that they're used slightly differently. And so this is the loss function that they propose. And, and this first piece, this green piece, this is exactly what you saw on the previous page. Again, it's just a pixel-wise comparison between the predicted map and the actual map. Jim and I have talked this over at length, and we've also discussed it with a couple fellows, and we believe that this loss function is, is potentially incorrect, but it's also very difficult to understand because this second piece of the loss function, what you see here in blue, this M sub SC right here, right? You'll notice it doesn't have a hat above it, right? Which means this, what they're including here, this is the human annotated map. At no point in this loss function do they include some sort of prediction that comes out of the network. So this loss function doesn't really make sense given that they don't describe exactly whether this uh, semi-supervised data set and this weekly supervised data set are disjoint or not, whether they include the same images. So we propose a slightly corrected version of the loss function that makes sense conceptually. And again, the first piece is exactly the same. It's just the pixel-wise comparison between these two map across all classes and across all images. The second piece is then basically the exact same thing, but just for the segmentation version. So this again is the ground truth, right? The M sub S without the hat. And then the predicted value is the M sub S hat, where up here you take the argmax of the background and the class specific feature map. In this scenario, it's just the argmax of all of the maps. So, you know, wherever a specific value is higher than all the other maps, we're going to assume that at that location, the object corresponding to that class is present. So this makes sense conceptually. Um, 
another thing to note is in the previous one, we, we think they made a typo because up here it's I sub S for the semi-supervised and then down here they say it's I sub W for the weekly supervised, but that's, that's neither here or there. But the, the main thing is that we're gonna include this second piece in the, in the loss function because it, it just makes sense to us, especially when you consider conceptually what this training process is doing then is trying to close the gap between these weekly predicted maps and these semi-supervised predicted maps. So that's, that's how we interpret the loss function. And Jim's gonna go through some of the experiments that they perform to basically prove that using this weekly supervised process ends up increasing the predicted ability of a, uh, a segmentation network. Yeah, so they uh, evaluated the models on the Pascal VSC 2012 uh, benchmark, which is quite a popular benchmark, with um, one background class and 20, 20 object classes. The accuracy metric that they used to evaluate this, uh, again, is quite a, a standard one, and that's the mean intersection over union, uh, which is quite simply, um, the, uh, the number of pixels in the union between the expected mask and the predicted mask um, that were predicted correctly. So it's just a percentage accuracy really between those. And so first, uh, I'm gonna go through some of the dense localization maps that the networks, the train networks produced. Um, and this is, sort of showing what uh, were, were on some of the explanation slides, uh, but now on a lot more examples. And uh, you can see uh, generally throughout, they show the same uh, trends where you have uh, the, the higher dilation rates producing noisier, but, but more uh, but activation maps which capture more of the object, uh, whereas the, the smaller, the, the, the maps with the smaller dilation rates um, produce more of the discriminative regions, um, but miss out a lot of the objects. Uh, and then the, the fact that when we combine these in the way that I described, they produce quite uh, good dense localization maps encapsulating most of the objects. Uh, interestingly, one of uh, the failure cases is shown at the bottom. Now, uh, the, the general trend here was that uh, it, the the algorithm it, it struggled really it struggled with uh, thin uh, long and thin uh, areas so things like chairs and tables um, it produced quite poor segmentation mass accuracy results here the beak of the birds might be throwing the model or perhaps the you know the, there are two birds kind of joined together um, yeah so there's definitely room for improvement with these uh, dense localization maps. And here are the accuracy results with those mean intersection of union scores. Uh, they also uh, show a lot of the other weekly supervised methods. So at the top, uh, we have the scribbles method, uh, which, uh, and, and then on the right, and then just below it, we have the bounding box methods. They perform quite well, but like we said, um, they're not ideal because you need lots of expensive data sets with bounding boxes and scribbles. Uh, and then also one uh, method I didn't mention with the, was the, uh, the point method, the spot method, uh, which performs not so well. Um, but uh, yeah, a, a much more popular approach is to use the image level annotations and the, uh, this paper achieves state of the art on that. The previous state of the art from uh, Hong et al. They, um, it's worth noting that they do quite well, but they also use uh, their training set there, yeah, is a, lot, um, is a lot larger. They use a lot of extra supplementary images and data sets um, to almost help you know, pre-train their model. Uh, Yet yeah, this paper still uh, does better, just with the normal Pascal data set. Here, um, now moving on from the, that's, I didn't really uh, make it clear, but that was just the weekly supervised model. So that was uh, just using the image level annotations, not using any strong, strong annotations of the pixel level supervision. Um, but now if we move on to the, well, that on the left here, we have the segmentations uh, produced by that weekly uh, supervised model. And we can see already it's producing uh, pretty good segmentation results. Uh, but as we move further to the right, we're 
adding more and more strongly supervised examples, uh, strongly supervised annotations. And uh, as, yeah, obviously as we increase the number of those, the, the maps become better and better um, towards the ground truth on the right. If we now go on to the, the results of the semi-supervised, so that's using both these weakly uh, annotated images and the strongly annotated images. Um, here they've uh, split up the table into the different methods that we use for the weak part of the supervision. So they use the weak part uh, in kind of parallel or before the uh, strong pixel level supervision. Uh, and as we had before, we have it split up into the uh, bounding boxes methods uh, and then the image level annotations. And here again, um, we achieve, they've achieved a state of the art result. And it's about 5%, 5 or 6, 7% better than just the weekly annotated examples. But that's still quite a, an impressive achievement for, the, for these weekly uh, annotated examples, the weekly annotated model, just to uh, produce a 60% accuracy uh, and, and these strong supervisions to just inc increase by about 5%. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, there, because, so Jim mentioned that there were a couple things they didn't make clear in the paper, such as why they chose VGG or how exactly they combined the class activation maps, given that there are different sizes. So uh, we decided to implement this and we did it in PyTorch and, and we learned a couple interesting things. So first of all, what you see here, the, these sizes are basically in one of the previous slides, we showed that they use VGG up until where the fully connected and pooling layers are. And then they basically throw that away and fit on that sort of dilation head. So this is the size of the images that come out of that portion right before the fully connected and pooling layers. So right before you would do the dilations according to different input sizes. So 321 by 321 is what they use in the paper. And one of the reasons they didn't use ResNet is obviously because the output image size at that level is much, much, much smaller. And the width of the kernel increases uh, multiplicatively as the dilation rate increases. So it basically increases according to this formula, right? So W here is the width, K is the size of the kernel, and then D is the dilation rate, right? So if we take a three by three kernel with a dilation rate of five, it's three plus five minus one is four times two is eight, which is how you end up with 11 by 11. So you can see that using a nine dilated kernel isn't even possible with ResNet unless you make the images huge. And even then when you do make the images huge, your resulting feature map is like two by two or three by three. And trying to interpolate that back up to a size of like, six something or or like eight uh, uh 896 by 896 or something like that is it, it's just really difficult and it produces a lot of noise which you can kind of see here so these are some of the results from vgg right so this is the activation map from the one dilated the three dilated the six dilated and the nine dilated convolution and these are the same dilation rates they use in the paper and you can sort of see how the information is spread around ResNet doesn't really work that well because one, it doesn't spread the information around as well as VGG does. Additionally, you'll notice that the dilation rates here in the ending layers are smaller because you can't even do a dilation rate of nine on the output of a ResNet image unless, like we said, you make the, the input size huge. And you can sort of see from this seven dilated result here that you can tell that this original map that's overlaid on the image was relatively small. I think it was something like six by six. So trying to blow something that's six by six back up to something that's, I think these were 448 by 448, it's, you're just sort of ruining the whole process because you're just creating this like super symmetric pattern and it's not really distributing the information like the, uh, re the VGG equivalent is. And so I think that's why they use VGG. Additionally, the way we produced this dense localization map, like uh, Jim mentioned, uh, you have to combine these three maps, right? And then add that to the one dilated class activation map. Now, 
these outputs, these maps, they're different sizes and they don't talk about how they upsample them or whether they use, you know, a stride and padding on some of these to keep them the same size. So what we did is, uh, you know, stride of one and a padding of one, we just kept it consistent. So these were different sizes and we basically just upsampled them using bilinear interpolation, which is a, a pretty popular method when you're dealing with 2D structures. So this the nine dilated and six dilated results were interpolated up to the three dilated size and then averaged. So you add them all together and you divide by three. The result of that average was then interpolated up to the one dilated size and just added to it, which is how you end up with this um, dilated uh, uh, dense localization map over here. Um, and so in conclusion, uh, the paper basically proposes using multiple dilated convolutional blocks to create class activation maps, which can be combined to produce these dense localization maps. These dense localization maps can then be used to create segmentation maps, which provide supervision for a segmentation network without needing to use or create expensive semi-supervised data. And the resulting approach produces state-of-the-art uh, state uh, mean IOU scores on the Pascal VOC 2012 data set for both weekly supervised and semi-supervised uh, 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 results when, combining this, when combined with the strong pixel level annotations. So um, that pretty much brings us to the end of the presentation. So does anybody have any questions? Hey, uh, thanks for the presentation. Looks good. I had a quick question. I was wondering if you considered using that bilinear interpolation to increase the resolution of the outputs from ResNet. Yeah, so that, that's exactly what you did because that's what you have to do in order to actually combine these. And that's what we were trying to say here. Ah, okay, like, that's what you said, yeah. Because the size is so small, like trying to take something, like in, in one scenario, I think when we used a nine dilated and had an input size of like 600 and something, this output was two by two, right? So trying to interpolate something like that back up to like a couple hundred by a couple hundred, you just end up with this like really, it doesn't look like it's actually giving you any informa information because it's just sort of this symmetrical pattern. So yeah, we, we did use bilinear interpolation, but the, the main issue is that the, you know, when using an input size of 224, VGG, right, the portion before the dilation is 14 by 14, whereas RedNet is seven by seven. So when you then use these dilated convolutions, some of which are really, really wide, ResNet just doesn't give you large enough feature maps that can be interpolated using bilinear interpolation and still produce meaningful results. You'll see that in this dense localization map, there's a lot of stuff up here that you probably wouldn't want highlighted. And it's also worth noting that because of how they produce the segmentation map, because they basically take the top 30% as foreground and then they use the saliency operation to produce the background, this might not matter, right? So if you look at just the red portion, it almost looks like ResNet does a much better job of sort of spreading the information across all of the head and part of the body when you compare it to the VGG equivalent. But again, depending on how you actually create the, the, the segmentation mask, you might end up including a bunch of this stuff up here. And to, and to really get an answer, we would have to look at this for, you know, a bunch of different types of images of, you know, different sort of orientations of objects and things like that. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, I guess this answers the question of why uh, they're using VGG, right? Yeah, I think that's why they use VGG because the results from ResNet, they're just too small to, to be very useful. And like, if you look at the way this is spread out, like these look much more symmetrical, which in some scenarios might be good, but clearly when you're trying to do something with this, like transfer discriminative information to a different part of the image, this sort of non-symmetrical uh, process or, or result seems to work much, much, much better when you compare the two dense localization maps. So they don't mention it explicitly in the paper, but we assume that's why they went with VGG. Yeah, I wanted to ask as a follow-up, um, just since I'm not as familiar with this stuff as, as you guys are going to be, um, do they, is it common to use VGG for these other um, image localization, object localization uh, techniques that we saw? So uh, it's worth noting that um, in this pipeline, VGG gets used for this process, right, to create this mask 
this actual network here, this segmentation network is something totally different. I'm trying to remember the name. It's some, something obscure like Deep Lab, something, something, something. It's something totally different that has absolutely nothing to do with VGG. So when it comes to segmentation right. networks, things like VGG and ResNet don't really work that well. There's, there's a couple other different architectures that are really popular when you're trying to do object segmentation like this. Yeah, yeah, no, I get what you're saying, but I mean the other, like, uh, other localization techniques where we're using the, the uh, convolutional features, right, to localize the objects. Is it common to use VGG for that technique? Um, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, uh, I, I guess it depends how they do it. There are probably some approaches that work better with VGG and some that work better with ResNet, depending on, you know, whether you're doing the sort of straightforward um, uh, class activation map approach like this, uh, then ResNet might work a little better, or if you're doing you know, some sort of combination, in which case VGG might work better. But off the top of my head, I honestly don't know. Hmm. Fair enough, Could, thank you. <clears throat> can I jump in here, guys? Yeah. It turns out that um, like VGG style networks work better for these type of things because I think it's, because the inefficiency of it allows for um, the ability to like learn different things. So style networks are often always VGG based and they say, if you try it with ResNet based or more advanced networks, it basically doesn't work. Um, so you can kind of Google that, um, could be some. <clears throat> Yeah, that actually makes sense, right? Because the whole point of ResNet, right, is to sort of feed the input back into the output. And I can see how with a process like this, like trying to localize an object, you, you might sort of throw the entire process off if you do that. So that the absence of that in the VGG network is probably one of the things that makes it uh, uh, more uh, well suited for this type of application. It's also uh, worth noting, Arshok in the in the in the general or the fellows channel just posted this paper, this GradCam plus plus. So GradCam is basically another version of these class activation maps, but it's weighted by the gradient according to the specific class label. And then GradCam plus plus is basically just a better version of that. So there's a good chance that you can basically do this entire pipeline and do this process, but instead of using the class activation maps here, you would use the grad cam maps or the, or the grad cam plus plus maps and you could potentially get an even better dense localization map, which is something that Jim and I uh, might tackle. Uh, yeah, you guys know or, or I'm even wondering, maybe they might mean that you could throw away the, uh, the dilated convolutions altogether, you know, because here they don't even use grad cam, you know, let alone grad cam plus. So there might be quite a big gap between the, the, the CAM performance, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it could be. Honestly, I, I think the best way to test that would literally just be to, to take a look at some of the maps for similar or same images used producing the three different methods. Did you guys also combine uh, with the saliency maps? No, we didn't get that far. We didn't do that, which it's actually something that we're planning on doing because like we mentioned, this so you know at first glance it looks like the vgg result is better than the resnet result but depending on how you create a segmentation mask from these images it, this might actually work better but again given what we've talked about that vgg is much better at doing this object localization i kind of doubt it but it would be interesting to see what some of the resulting segmentation maps look like and also regarding the saliency maps did you know if the authors use it also for the multi-label segmentation so the the multi-label set so by multi-label you're referring to this this bottom part right the, yes. the pixel level annotation so the authors didn't do anything with the pixel level data the idea is basically this process right here this is done using only image level annotations and the ground truth is what you produce using the dilation process and this is just the predicted outcome you know the argmax of the background and whatever class specific feature map so using this process, training only on image level data, that's the result that uh, Jim was talking about here. This column you see this week, this is basically training the network on that data and then evaluating it on pixel level annotations from the Pascal VOC data set. So they didn't do anything in terms of creating saliency maps or localization maps for the semi-supervised data set. They only did it for the, the weekly supervised data. 
Okay, do you have another, um, I remember another slide in which you had many elements, including a dog. I don't remember which one was it. Not sure, this one? No, no, to the right. They had many elements in segmentation. Yeah, that one. Oh, okay, yeah. For that weekly supervised, I mean, but there was, that was weekly supervised, that was not semi-supervised. This, this is the process leading up to the weekly supervised, right? So this is the process, this is basically what we showed you on the, the last couple slides. This process is basically what we demonstrate here, how you combine the uh, class activation maps from the different dilation maps to get this dense localization map, right? Mm -hmm. So this entire process, what you're seeing on this slide is just this top portion right here of yes. this network. Yes. My question is, um, I'm not completely aware how the CNC map works, but for example, for each one of these classes, would it be the same CNC map you will be combining with, for example, the class of person and the dog and car? No, so the saliency map is specific to an image, right? So they're gonna vary from image to image. It's class independent, right? So this oh. is the saliency map for this specific image. And then this is the class, the dense localization map for this specific image. And so you're taking the top 30% to produce the foreground and anything yeah. that's less than 0 0.06 to produce the background and then combining them while ignoring conflicting pixels is how you end up getting this segmentation map. But this entire process has to be conducted on an image by image basis. Sorry, I mixed up. I really, some, some moment I thought it was the same image. But yes. No, no, no worries. Yeah, so this, this has to be performed for every single image, which is why, again, there's this like whole independent pipeline that happens up here to produce these, what they use as the ground truth. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Anyone else? All right, I think we can call it a day unless anyone else has any questions. Jim and I will post the slides in the channel. We'll also post a link to the, the notebook where we implemented this and, and did some of the analysis. And then we'll let you guys know if we end up implementing this with GradCam or GradCam++ if it works any better. All right, see you guys.